On Colorado's western slope, water is everything. From high atop the Rocky Mountains to the Grand Valley and beyond, these waters have shaped our history. They form the backbone of our rural economies. And they have sustained generations of hardworking families. Since 1937, the Colorado River District has been safeguarding western slope water for agriculture, for recreation, for industry, and for the environment. We were formed 82 years ago to give voice and protection to the needs of the river and the people and the communities that depend on it. We run a cow-calf operation for the ranch and we supplement our income through running a fly fishing guided outfitter. The water is what matters to all of us and what we all need. The river is in a tug-of-war state between consumptive use and non-consumptive needs. For irrigation diversion projects associated with agriculture, we need cool, clean water. Trout fishermen downstream needs cool, clean water. The River District acts as a great intermediary between all of those needs. The river is what binds us all. Whether you're a rancher in Moffat County or a boater in Summit County, you depend upon the Colorado River. And getting people to recognize their common interests and the leverage we have when we speak with one voice is what the Colorado River District does. People just don't realize how valuable the River District is. By bringing us together, we all of a sudden understood this was our river and what was good for one of us was good for both of us. It's an opportunity that the West Slope has to have a strong voice. And if the people of the West Slope don't recognize that, the Colorado River and all its tributaries that we love and what brought us here is gonna go away too. We're either in it together or we're going down one at a time. If you take the environmental needs for the river and you realize what's important for the environment, those same exact things are important for ag. They're important for industry and they're very important for recreation. 10% of our gross domestic product is outdoor recreation. People that like to paddle on rivers also like to eat Palisade peaches and live here. The River District's doing a great job changing the framework to be one of collaboration. On the West Slope, water is the lifeblood of this community. Our water and our ability to serve agricultural producers and industrial consumers, the municipalities, we all depend on having water in the river and no one wants to see a dry river. Without water, you take that out of the picture, you have nothing. Without the River District, the West Slope would be a very different place. We'd have less water in our rivers, we'd have less agriculture, less of an economic engine that is recreation. I can't survive as an ag business if I don't have my water. The role of the River District is to work with entities around our basin in a cohesive way to accomplish the local goals as well as the Western Colorado goals as far as protecting our natural resource and making sure that water is used correctly. The River District has managed over the years to fight the Front Range and the Trans Mountain Diverters. We're able to bring a voice to the table and present that united front that is so important at keeping water in our rivers flowing westward. The next generation is here. My grandsons are growing up here. We've got to make sure that they have the same chance that my daughter did, who's now here, and that I have for my dad. The whole West Slope to me is a natural resource-based economy and water is number one in that natural resource. And how do we manage that so that the next generation has the same joy that we have? For more than 80 years, one entity has been working to keep West Slope water on the Western Slope. These are your rivers. 
This is your water. And this is your Colorado River District. Hello, and thank you for being here today for our Water With Your Lunch webinar. My name is Zane Kessler, and I am the Director of Government Relations for the Colorado River District based in Glenwood Springs. Um, I'm also happy to be your MC today. Uh, this is the second in a four-part series of lunch hour discussions focusing on important water issues facing uh, Western Colorado water users. Um, so I hope you've got your lunch and your water with you. Um, other beverages is perfectly fine, given that most of us are stuck at home uh, working from our computers. But um, I, uh, I want to, before we get started and introduce our first guests for today, I want to take just a minute to um, advance this slide and tell you a little bit about who the River District is. Um, the Colorado River District was created in 1937 to serve as the principal water policy and planning agency for the 15 Western Slope counties that collectively form the headwaters and the main stem of the Yampa, the White, the Green, the Gunnison, and the main stem of the Colorado River. Um, we uh, encompass 15 total counties, um, an area that is roughly a, a third of the entire land mass of the state. This area uh, contains 80% of the state's total water, but only about 10% of the state's population, uh, leading to the imbalance that, that led to our creation. Um, we were formed in direct response to the development of the Colorado Big Thompson Project, what was then and still is today the largest Trans Mountain diversion in the state, taking some 220,000 acre feet of water a year from the West Slope over to the Thirsty Front Range. Um, snowpack within this region, uh, importantly, uh, provides about 65% of the natural flow of the Colorado River at Lee's Ferry. Um, so that's a big burden that we carry on the Western Slope for a river that supports some 40 million people throughout the American Southwest and even to Mexico. Um, we're governed by a board of directors uh, 15 directors, one from each county. Those directors are appointed by their respective boards of county commissioners, and they help to guide our policy decisions, our budget actions, and the work of the district. Um, we are funded exclusively, almost exclusively, through a mill levy on real property within the district. That mill levy is about a quarter of a single mill. Uh, we're consistently one of the lowest assessments on your property tax bill on the Western Slope. Um, but we do want to say thank you to property owners in the West, on the West Slope and let you know that we take our charge very seriously and we work to ensure that those revenues that are collected to, to fund our work are used effectively and efficiently in, in working to accomplish our mission to protect West Slope water and keep it on the Western Slope. So the purpose of today's Water With Your Lunch webinar is a discussion of uh, of state and federal policy issues. Um, this year's legislative session in Colorado turned out to be very different than anyone could have expected. Uh, the normal 120 day session adjourned on June 15th um, after only 84 days in session, uh, but it was about 160 days in the making due to an unprecedented uh, mid-session adjournment due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, pandemic or not, I should say that the Colorado River District works to maintain a regular presence at the state capitol each and every year uh, in order to advocate uh, for our water users on the West Slope. Um, so next I'll, I'll introduce our first two guests. Um, before I introduce them though, um, and while Alicia brings them onto the screen, I want to note how lucky we all are on the West Slope to have a talented group of legislators that work with us, regardless of party affiliation, to protect West Slope water users, um, both during the legislative session and throughout the year. Our first guest is Dylan Roberts. Dylan is a third generation Coloradan, born and raised in Route County. He represents Colorado's 26th dis district, which uh, encompasses both Eagle and Route counties. Uh, Representative Roberts serves as the chair of the House Rural Affairs and Agriculture Committee, 
uh, where the vast majority of water legislation uh, goes through the process. Uh, the second guest um, who will speak after Dylan is uh, Representative Mark Catlin. Uh, Mark represents Colorado's 26th district, which encompasses a bigger stretch of territory, Dolores, Montezuma, Montrose, and San Miguel counties. Um, he was born and raised in Montrose County, grew up on an irrigated farm raising sugar beets, coors barley, sweet corn, and seed beans. Um, he serves also on the House Rural Affairs and Ag Committee, along with Representative Roberts, and he serves as the Montrose County Representative on the Colorado River District's Board of Directors. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dylan to make some remarks, and then Mark can back clean up. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Zane. Uh, it's great to be with everybody this afternoon. Thanks for tuning in and uh, thank you for having me. Um, as Zane said, I represent uh, House District 26, which is Eagle County and Route County. Um, I was lucky enough to grow up in, in Steamboat and I uh, live down in Eagle County now. Uh, when I'm not a state legislator, I am a deputy district attorney and I'm on my lunch break right now from that job. Uh, we just got done with the session a couple weeks ago and, and now we're um, back to our, our real life or our other life, I guess. Um, but one of my favorite things to do as a state legislator is work on water policy. And uh, I'm really thankful to be uh, serving with people like Representative Catlin and working with uh, the Colorado River District uh, and Zane and all of your team uh, at the Capitol uh, to advance really good and smart bipartisan water policy. Um, I am going to talk about one bill that we did this past session that I'm particularly proud of that uh, worked really closely with the River District on. Um, that was House Bill 1157. Uh, and this is a bill that we got actually passed all the way through and signed by the governor before the coronavirus uh, adjournment of the legislature had to occur. So um, that was exciting. But this is actually the second year that we uh, worked um, to get that bill passed. So what this bill does is it expands and um, changes the existing in-stream flow program that we have in Colorado, which is, as many of you know, really important to preserving stream flow and ecological health, uh, our outdoor recreation, and downstream agriculture during dry years. Uh, so we have the in-stream flow program that's been in place for a long time, but it's very limited uh, and could only be used uh, once during a 10-year period, and then you, can, you can't use it or three times during a 10-year period, and then you couldn't ever use it again. Um, so we uh, have worked on this bill for a while now, and what it does is it expands that uh, usage allowance to two more 10-year periods, and then you can use it within five uh, for five out of those 10 years during each of those 10-year periods. Um, there's a lot of other details, and the reason why this bill didn't pass last year is because we didn't work through all those details. Um, but it's something that I wanted to keep working on because it's really important for my district, especially the Yampa River that flows right through Steamboat and so many outdoor uh, recreation uh, businesses rely on. Um, but I didn't want it to be a big partisan fight or anything like that. So I uh, went to Zane and the River District over the last summer uh, in Water Congress and we worked through this and I worked really closely uh, with Representative Catlin, Representative Will from, from Garfield County um, across the aisle. You know, water shouldn't be political in my opinion. It should be based in the, in the policy because it is so complicated and so important. And we made some big changes to the bill from last year to this year, uh, like allowing more uh, comment period and allowing uh, for appeals to happen uh, for people who, who might be injured by the program. And it requires uh, that the applicant be the one that carries the burden to show no injury. Uh, and so with those changes, we brought the bill back and it passed uh, the House Agriculture Committee unanimously, it passed the House floor unanimously, it passed the Senate with little opposition and was signed by the governor. Uh, and while still preserving the goal of my original intent from the bill I introduced last year, by working with all of you, with working uh, across the aisle, we were able to get a bill that um, gets everything done that we need to get done, but protects uh, all of our other important water rights holders uh, and in the process. So that's an example of, of the types of legislation I, I'm so happy to work on. Uh, we did get the water projects bill done. I'll, I'll note that as well this year, even with the coronavirus pandemic and the hit on our budget, I'm really happy that I got to work with, with Rep Catlin on that too, to uh, ensure that our commitment to our water infrastructure does not um, go away even in the time, in the scary time of a global pandemic and the economic recession that has resulted. So I'll turn it back to Zane. Thanks for letting me talk about that bill and I look forward to answering some questions here. 
Thanks. Uh, really appreciate it, Representative Roberts. Uh, next up is uh, Representative Catlin, who I believe is going to speak to House Bill 1159. Before he goes, though, I do want to uh, let our guests know that we do have a Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, we're going to have a, a Q&A session together uh, at the end of this session and then at the end of our federal affairs update. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please submit those and we'll do our best to get to any and all questions we can. Thanks. And uh, you're up, Representative Cap. Well, thanks, Zane. Thanks for hosting this today. You know, I've said to you before, I'm starting to feel like a teenager because I spend my time on Zoom, Hangout, and Skype to where I feel like a, junior, you know, a teenager catching up with all my buddies. But I'm glad that we're able to do this. This, is, uh, this water with your lunch seems to me to be a good idea. It keeps people in touch. It gives us an opportunity to talk about things. As was touched on earlier, this has been an extremely strange session. You know, we started out thinking, okay, we're going to get a lot of things done. And right in the middle of it, we all had to go home. And, uh, you know, that didn't help anything. Um, but one of the things that did seem to kind of hang true through the whole session was water is still something that's important. And it, and was in, as, uh, as uh, Dylan Roberts said, it seemed to be that where there was more bipartisanship, willing to work together, on these natural resource issues than some of the others. So we did move some things that are important. I got an opportunity to sponsor 1159, which is a bill that puts some certainty back into some of the water right holders in the ag community that the state of Colorado is, is going to administer those water rights as they were intended before in-stream flow rights were ever thought of. So in other words, a, a grower or a rancher would not have to be worried about whether or not he was going to be curtailed in order for the in-stream flow downstream to have some more water. Um, it allows stock watering, it allows some of the things that we've historically done. And the in-stream flow program, I think was started in 1981. And uh, in the legislative uh, intent, it was that any of these existing practices in the river would be allowed to continue after this in-stream flow right was uh, filed. So it was one of those things that as time marched forward, people had kind of forgotten some of that intent. And there were some people that were really concerned. And there were some issues where, you know, there was a great misunderstandings between water right holders and the state engineer's office. This piece of legislation that was uh, like a, a was bipartisan. I heard Dylan say that his got through unscathed. So did this one. It was um, unanimous on the floor of the house. And what it does is it allows these people to continue to act, to do those ag practices that were in place prior to having an in-stream flow placed on the river someplace down below. And I think what that will do is it will allow the state of Colorado to still benefit from those ag water rights and the in-stream flow rights because those flows will still be there. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that's happening is that all of us are getting to be a lot more aware of the river that we live around. The piece that was uh, published before, before we started this, talks about all of us being involved in the river. And I think that's one of the things that we're all trying to do here is to make sure that what my practices are don't impact those of recreation and of the environment. And, you know, when we start looking at the western slope of Colorado, we are the people that figure this out. It's not the other people. It's not the downstream. And it's not on the other side of the mountain. They have a completely different feel for our water because they want it. We need to keep it. So by doing some of these kind of bills, I think we're going to find that we're going to be a much stronger area, particularly the river district area, because this is where water policy really, really Gets its, um, gets its legs. The things that we figure out here on the Western Slope end up going downstream and going over, over the mountains too. Um, so I'm excited. I think maybe Colorado is growing up to a certain degree. I think we're gonna find that there is more co collaboration, cooperation, all of those type of buzzwords that we're talking about nowadays, but it's starting to pay out. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling better about this. I think we're all going to be on the same team. I know there's a lot of people that may have questions, so I think I'll just stop my comments there and we'll see what we can do. 
Thank you, uh, Director Representative Catlin. Uh, always appreciate your being here and, and appreciate everything you're doing uh, for Western Slope water users at the state capitol. Um, our next uh, guest is, is Gail Berry. Gail is uh, a friend and a colleague who has a long track record of service and work under the Gold Dome in Denver. Um, Gail's a former state representative from Grand Junction and currently works as a, a lobbyist in government relations uh, professional specializing in natural resource and uh, budgetary issues. During her eight year tenure in the legislature, Gail was a member of the all powerful joint budget committee. Uh, she was also on the house appropriations committee and was also chair of the house transportation committee. So Gail, uh, I think you're gonna give us just a quick update on the, the hard hit that was the budget season this year. And, then I'll bring uh, Mark and Dylan back and the four of us can start answering some questions. Great, thank you, Zane. I appreciate that very much. And uh, I just wanna quickly also reiterate uh, to all of you how fortunate we are to have Representatives Catlin and Roberts, as well as the rest of our delegation, as you can tell from their comments, very knowledgeable on water issues. And uh, we're just really fortunate to have them as part of our team. I will give a real quick update to the state budget. Uh, some of you saw in the media, it was a tough year with COVID and then the resulting uh, closures for the economy. Uh, the hit was huge. The budget committee ended up with a 3.3 billion, B with a billion, dollars swing in what they had expected from November to what they actually had when they balanced the budget in June. So that was huge. It ended up being about a 25%, 28% reduction in the amount of the general fund, which is the main tax revenues that the state has to spend. So the budget committee was very busy. Certainly all of the legislators were very busy and working at those policies. The impacts were across the board, of course, with something of that size. Big hit on K-12 education uh, because there was some discretion there and there were also some federal dollars that had come in that would, they couldn't replace that, but they really helped to ease that huge hit. So uh, overall, K-12 was down uh, $723 million from where they expected to be. Um, higher education also had a cut of about 500 million. Those were big ticket items. The JBC hopes to restore those next year, but we'll see. It depends on how that, um, how the economy and the economic forecasts to continue to come in. Um, the other specific areas that we tracked for the River District uh, were within the Department of Natural Resources, of course. Um, there, General appropriation is $308 million, um, various things for various departments, about 308 million. And they had a decrease of 29 million. So that's 8.7%. That's a big hit, but the biggest hit was in their general fund instead of the cash fund. And I don't want to get to be too nerdy here, but um, they overall, they had to uh, cut 23% uh, from the general fund. And that was a big hit. The hardest hitting hit areas that were of concern to us, of course, uh, were eliminating the $10 million that would have gone to this implementing the state water plan implementation. That had been a priority for legislators, for the budget committee, and uh, early on when all of the revenues were looking good, that was going to be funded. But now that has been uh, taken out of the budget for next year. They're hopeful in following years that could happen, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, we'll all stay on it. And in addition, um, the, the other hard hit area was uh, for the CWCB, Colorado Water Conservation Board projects. Uh, that The way that works in one year, the legislature passes legislation to fund projects and they are funded in the following year. So the 2019 projects that were to be funded uh, could not be funded because the money just wasn't there. So that was one of the one of the other areas that was hit. Some minor good news, there's an additional employee for a water conservation specialist. So that will help out with the Department of Natural Resources. And uh, they also funded a, a vehicle for one of the commissioners, which was very badly needed so that they could do their work. So that was good. 
one of the other main uh, parts that had an impact on the budget, you may recall sports betting that was on the November ballot in 2019 after it had been passed by the legislature and referred onto the ballot. It passed in November 2019. And that basically, um, we worked very hard to get uh, appropriation of some of those proceeds to go into fund the state water plan. We were successful in that, it passed, and ultimately we would get between eight and six and eight million dollars, depending on expenses and some of the other other appropriations for that. Happy to answer questions, but I won't go into any of the, the nitty gritty detail on it. That um, sports betting started in May 2020. As we all know, the world's been upside down a little bit, so we'll see how those revenues come in. Uh, they may or may not be very as strong as was forecast just because of the economy, but the good news is we're in place to get some of that money for the state water plan when it does come in. Um, one final issue, the Gallagher, uh, some of you may know about how the interaction in our constitution of the Gallagher Amendment, that is the split between residential and commercial, all other property that comes in. There's a residential assessment rate. That was a big topic with the legislature. There will be an issue on the ballot uh, this fall to repeal that mandated split. One of the impacts that will happen if that, if does not pass. There are a lot of impacts all over the place, but one of them of concern to the River District, if that residential assessment rate drops in the next legislative year, it could be a hit to the, the River District in their revenues at the local level, uh, the different counties of about $400 million, possibly more than that. So um, that's something that we're going to be watching very closely as that comes onto the ballot in November. Finally, there will be another economic forecast coming up. The news in the June forecast was it was not quite as dismal as expected, but we still have some tough times ahead for the state budget. So with that, I'll answer questions when we go to bat. Great. Thank you, Gail. I appreciate your overview. I know that was a lot to pack into just a few minutes and, and know that, that we at the River District are more than willing to answer uh, more detailed questions that we don't have time to get to today, especially on the intricacies of the state budget. Um, Alicia, if you can bring uh, Representatives Catlin and Roberts back, um, we'll jump into a few of these questions that are flooding in. Um, uh, the first question, uh, and, and I'll maybe just allow uh, representatives Catlin and Roberts to tag team this one um, it has to do with interstate and intrastate water demands. Um, question is from Pam and it is, we know that a water call from the lower states is inevitable at some point in our not too distant future. What can be done to slow the ever increasing problem of diversion to the front range? So big river or intrastate. I'll, I'll allow you guys to take this me, as you'd like. Let me take a shot at that. You know, I'm not positive that it will be inevitable. I think one of the things the Western Slope particularly needs to be thinking about is modernizing our delivery systems. Um, the low-hanging fruit in my mind is piping and lining the ditches and canals that we use here on the Western Slope because they're, you know, they're 100 years old. They still function exactly the way they were supposed to, but leakage and seepage costs us maybe 20 to 25% of the water that we do divert. It seems to me like if the state really wants to talk about water conservation, those are the places we need to be starting. We've proven that in the Uncompagre Valley that piping and lining can help a lot with supply. And I think that's one of the places where we really need to start taking a look. Uh, I'll, I'll just add, this is definitely, you know, a concern and something we're talking about a lot, um, whether it's legislation or, or other efforts to either stop more diversions or increase um, efficiency programs in Colorado so we're not having to, to worry about a downstream call. I, I agree with Rep. Cal. I'm not sure it's inevitable, but I don't think we should not be planning for it and trying to do everything we can. On that, a local note for me here in Eagle County, I know there's a proposed assessment of the Whitney Creek um, Homestake Lake area, Homestake Valley uh, exploration. Um, the comment period, and they, it's, they want to explore to bring water over the Front Range for a development um, out of um, 
water out of our area. Um, the comment period for that ends today. So if anybody's interested in commenting on that and expressing your objection, that uh, friendly reminder that that ends today. Thanks, Dylan. Um, I've got a, a question about the Gallagher Amendment here and just what the, the ratchet down in the residential assessment rate would mean. And I, I think I might take that on if you guys are okay with it. Um, one thing we've looked at very carefully is the Gallagher Amendment and it's, it's the impacts of the Gallagher Amendment along with Tabor and the reduction in oil and gas revenues uh, on the Western Slope that have led the Colorado River District Board to strongly consider going to the ballot in November for a, uh, a small but meaningful uh, mill levy increase. Uh, the current proposal would be to increase our mill levy from a quarter of a single mill to a half of a single mill. That would end up being about a uh, dollar and 90 cents per hundred thousand dollars of home value. Um, and, and one thing we do know is that if the, the May economic forecast proved to be correct, the, the state legislature could be asked to cut the statewide RER from 7.15 to 5.88. Uh, that would represent a nearly 18% drop in residential property taxes. Um, that would be a huge hit to special districts across the West Slope and across the state. Um, our staff at the district estimates that a drop in the RER of that amount would have a nearly 400 to $450,000 negative impact on the district's general fund revenue. And of course, because of Tabor, that, that revenue would be lost forever unless we went to the voters um, to restore it. So um, thanks for the question on, on Gallagher. It's a complicated topic. Uh, again, it's something we're happy to dive into. Um, with that, I think we probably have time for one more question. Let me get back to the Q and A's. Um, Here's a good one. Um, what is demand management as it may pertain to the use of Colorado River system water? Um, that's from a water wonk here on the Western Slope. Um, and, and maybe I'll just ask uh, quickly if, if Reps Catlin and, and Roberts can just give us a couple of, of comments on demand management. You all know that the River District has been a leader um, in ensuring that the state's policy was um, that any demand management program be voluntary, temporary, and compensated in nature. And also it's the district's belief that, that it, it should not be looked at as a foregone conclusion. And, and it's our job, I think, on the Western Slope to examine all potential alternatives before we go down that road. But with that, I'll shut up and let you guys uh, wrap it up in, for this Q&A session. Thanks, guys. Well, I went first last time, Dylan. Yeah, sorry, I was getting unmuted. Um, I, I agree, I appreciate what you said, Zane, about that we shouldn't just assume that this is a foregone conclusion. However, if the state legislature is ever involved in a demand management um, program, or at least setting forth the parameters for one, um, I personally agree that it should be voluntary, temporary, and compensated. Um, so, you know, we talked about this in the water interim committee last summer. Uh, Mark will remember, and, and we had a potential bill idea about making sure that we gather public input uh, during any of this and, and try to, you know, while it still might have to be pieces of legislation, we would want to have public hearings prior to any legislative session where these were considered so that we were getting proper input um, on how to make it um, temporary, voluntary, and compensated. The compensated part is going to be the tough part, in my opinion, given what Gail just talked about and the limited resources that the state budget is going to have over the next several years. I'm hoping that if we do get to a demand management point, that's well beyond any coronavirus uh, budget hits that we're, that we're still going through. So <laughs> let's get through coronavirus first and then have to deal with demand management, I guess. Um, but something that's always on our radar, if when we do get to have the water committee again, uh, I think this should be the, one of the top items on our agenda. Well, in, in regards to demand management, I, I think one of the things that we've got to start talking about is every community that's affected by it, not just the agricultural community, but Main Street needs to recognize that there are a lot of secondary economic waves that will go down Main Street. If, if you don't farm the ground that you've got going out there at the edge of town, then it's going to show up on Main Street because people don't need to buy the goods and services. 
So the whole community is going to have to be involved with making those decisions. Um, I think the other thing that's going to end up being is that um, uh, people that are injured are probably going to have to, we need to, we may need to look at how we expand that. It, it's not just the ag community. When I'm saying this is that demand management will change the communities that we live in because there's going to be blank ground out there at the edge. The other thing that concerns me about demand management is the three words, temporary. Temporary is all that it is. It's not a permanent fix. So unless we decide that we want a permanent, permanent blank ground around our, our towns, we've got to be thinking about how can we fix this? And that's one of the things that I keep talking about, and I'll bound, pound on my drum a little bit more, is the delivery systems really need to be looked at. It's not necessarily how much water we can save on the ground, because ag is learning and is technology is catching up with us rapidly. The delivery systems are still in the 1900s, early 1900s. And uh, some attention needs to be paid to them before we go to taking a look at saying, well, we're not gonna farm this piece of ground, but we're still gonna run water down this old ditch. So hopefully those conversations are gonna be held. And I think the state legislature will probably be the last to do anything. Um, it really needs to be decided by the people that are impacted and, imp and impacted. The people that are gonna be suffering from it um, really need to have their, uh, their input given. And it's not simply ag. Every community is gonna to have to be involved with this because uh, we're all water users. Thank you, Representative Catlin. Um, thank you, all three of you, for being here with us. We really appreciate your service and your leadership. And um, I will note, uh, before I let these guys go, we've gotten a ton of questions here that we just unfortunately don't have time to answer. Um, some really good questions. We will work to um, provide written responses to each of those, and we'll get back to, to as many of those as possible. Uh, next up, uh, so again, thank you, Representatives Catlin and Roberts. Thank you, Gail. Um, really appreciate your insight and look forward to having you back at a future Water With Your Lunch. So, All right, uh, next up, we've got, um, well, actually, I'll here um, want to say just a couple of words that at the, the Colorado River District, we also work um, to advocate for West Slope water users at the federal level. Uh, we work throughout the year to inform and advise federal policy uh, makers, um, that's federal officials and members of Congress on water issues and policy matters that impact our constituents on the Western Slope. Um, the River District's team utilizes a number of key federal programs to bring federal dollars to the Western Slope from US to, excuse me, USDA, the Department of Interior and elsewhere. Our next guests will provide a, a brief overview of some of those important programs and a brief update on key legislation that's currently uh, being debated and, and is on the horizon in Washington, D.C. Um, so with that, I'll, uh, I'll invite Sarah and Garrett to join us. Um, Sarah, and, Sarah Tucker and uh, Garrett Durst are both from Natural Resource Results, which is a lobbying and government affairs firm in Washington, D.C. Um, their firm is highly experienced um, and specialized in water and natural resource policy issues at the federal level. Sarah Tucker joined Natural Resource Results after serving as a senior professional staff member for the Senate Energy and Natural Resource Committee. She worked for three consecutive chairs on that committee, uh, Senators Bingaman, Wyden and Landrew. She also was the lead staff for the Water and Power Subcommittee, where she was responsible for covering the Bureau of Reclamation's budget policies and programs. Um, and she's gonna be joined by Garrett Durst. Uh, Garrett joined Natural Resource Results after serving as Deputy Chief, Chief of Staff and Legislative Director for Congressman John Garamendi. Uh, Garrett was intimately involved in the development and enactment of a legislation that made significant enhancements to the way that the federal government addresses water operations in the West. Um, notably, uh, prior to serving on the congressman's team, uh, Garrett worked on his family's farm in California's Sacramento Valley. 
So with that, um, I'd invite Sarah and Garrett to, to come and give us a quick overview. Great. Can you all hear me? I can so. hear you great. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Zane. And um, we, Garrett and I really appreciate this opportunity to be with you all today. I have to start out by telling you that I was supposed to be rafting the Yampa River this week with my family, but due to coronavirus, I'm I'm stuck inside, and uh, I guess, you know, this is the next best, best thing to rafting the Yampa is to be with you all today. So a big fan of Western Colorado. It's a beautiful part of our country, and I look forward to getting back out there at some point soon. Um, Zane, thanks for that background. You know, we are a small firm in D.C. We only work in the natural resources arena. Um, all five of us in the firm are avid sportsmen and love to fish. Um, Garrett and I have taken many trips uh, out west to fish and any chance we can get outside and, and be on a river, we jump on it. So, you know, you guys have some of the best <clears throat> rivers and streams around you. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Garrett who can start off by giving just an overview of all the different pieces that are uh, on, you know, in in front of us in terms of what's happening in Congress. There is a lot going on. So Garrett, why don't you take it over? Sure. Um, again, Garrett Durst here. Um, appreciate everyone's time today. Um, one thing I want to quickly touch on before jumping into the, the federal side of things, there was a lot of discussion about um, collaboration and working together, whether it's across the aisle or with, with entities that don't, don't normally work together on water issues um, and growing up on the farm and then dealing with water in Congress. I mean, it's, it's, it's really refreshing to hear you guys talk that way. Um, that's, that's how you get things done, right? I mean, you've got you've to work with people. You've got to focus on the policies. Don't let politics get in the way. And, and you know, those people that really care about the resource are the right people to be having these types of discussions. So with that, um, Congress actually has a lot on its plate in the next, oh, six months um, and not very much time to get it done. So starting with infrastructure, um, you know, it's a topic that we've heard a lot of discussion about coming out of the White House, coming out of uh, Democrats in Congress, coming, coming out of Republicans in Congress. Um, when we get to future slides, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more detail there. Uh, there are a number of Western water bills that are floating around in Congress right now. Um, both in the House and Senate, and uh, those those bills would provide additional funding for existing programs, uh, modify some existing programs, um, you know, make changes to the way that that Congress appropriates money to to Western water projects. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, public lands package there, the Great American Outdoors Act is is a large piece of legislation that would provide a lot of funding um, to tackle deferred maintenance issues on on public lands. Um, WARDA, the Army Corps of Engineers legislation that Congress tackles every two years or so, uh, is currently making its way through the legislative process. And, and of all the things that you see on the screen here, uh, WARDA is probably the thing that is most likely to be signed into law, aside from the appropriations process, which always comes with its own challenges, and, and we'll get to that uh, down the road. Uh, and then additionally, there's there's growing talk of an, another coronavirus relief package. Um, this would be probably on the smaller scale, um, not not this kind of grand stimulus 2009 type legislation that that at one point folks were kind of looking at and thinking might happen, but more targeted, really focusing on mitigating impacts of the virus, um, replenishing some of the programs that that have been funded through previous stimulus stimulus bills. So, perfect. Oh, sorry. So this, as we speak uh, on the House floor, uh, Republicans and Democrats are debating HR2, the Moving Forward Act, which is uh, the House Democrats infrastructure proposal. Um, that bill is a massive 2300 page behemoth that includes, uh, you know, everything from surface transportation type uh, provisions that deal with you know, funding for roads and bridges to the inclusion of a, a couple Western water provisions. Um, uh, Representative Huffman from California has a bill titled the Future Drought Act that is included in, in this infrastructure package, as well as uh, Representative Torres Small's Western Water Security Act. 
So that bill will likely pass uh, probably late tomorrow or early on Thursday. It's going to be voted out of the House on party lines. Um, there's there's a lot on the uh, kind of green infrastructure side that that Republicans have have uh, pointed to as being concerning. Uh, the White House earlier this morning made public that it is opposed to this legislation. So again, it'll pass with Democratic votes, but that's probably the end of the road for this particular piece of legislation. That said, you know, there are these Western water provisions in there and, and you know, the House passing those provisions theoretically could put some pressure on the Senate uh, to move some, some water legislation of their own, uh, which Sarah will get to in a moment. Um, and, and that would likely occur in the lame duck session. So on the Senate side, we have seen a number of bills introduced over the course of the past year and a half dealing with the Bureau of Reclamation and how to manage Western water supplies. Uh, the first one, S-1932, is probably the most relevant because it's the most comprehensive and it's also introduced by your Senator. Senator Gardner and Senator Feinstein from California introduced this bipartisan bill and it includes provisions that cover storage, desal, desalinization, title, uh, Title 16 and Water Smart funding, and it's uh, it hasn't made it through the uh, committee process, but it's often touted as kind of the the big Western Water package. That if anything were to move, that's that's sort of the the go-to bill to look at. In addition, there's a bill from Senators Udall and Heinrich from New Mexico, S2718, which is very similar to the bill in the House that Congresswoman Torres Small introduced that Garrett mentioned. There's another bill from the senators in Arizona, McSally and Cinema, that looks at um, setting up a fund in the treasury to provide money for aging water infrastructure projects. And finally, I added on here, S-886 is a Indian Water Rights Settlement Extension Act, which has already passed the Senate by a voice vote earlier this month and is also in the infrastructure package in the House. And I put that on there because there is a, an effort and um, there's some momentum behind these Indian water rights uh, settlement packages. And I think it's relevant to your world because the more that these Indian water rights are settled, the more certainty there is for water in the basin. So we'll continue to, to track that. Um, and then specifically on the Colorado River, obviously there are a number of programs that are relevant to your work and uh, the programs that you rely on in, in your state and your area. Um, but first, I just wanna say that the passage of the drought contingency plan last year was historic, not only because of, of what was in that uh, statute, but also just how quickly it moved. And I think it's a testament to the strong working relationships between the seven basin states and the ability to once there is an agreement to actually get it through Congress at rapid speed. I've never seen anything move so quickly before and it shows that there is an incredible power to, to those relationships and that ability to get things done. Uh, now obviously it's on to the 2007 guidelines and updating those and the bureaus in the process of working on a draft review of that um, of those guidelines to look to the to, to the next set of those guidelines and then on the federal side you know there are appropriations for several different programs that are relevant um, to the colorado river i'd say salinity control being one of the the biggest and you know looking for federal funding for that program is always important uh, and then obviously the the federal funding for the upper basin and san juan recovery programs is important those funds come from hydropower and uh, you know things are Things are different all the time on that front because of the, um, the changing uh, river levels. And then the water smart funding, you know, that's seen a huge increase in the last year even. Uh, we're now at $55 million a year, and that's up 21 million just from FY19 level. So there's increased, uh, there's increased support for water smart, and there's, there's new efforts to look to, at ways to expand that program and to get more funding out to different uh, groups and to um, NGOs as well. So that also is something to, to watch for. And then finally, the Cooperative Watershed Management Act, which is a really small program. It was authorized back in 2016. And it's, it's small. It's only authorized at 20 million and receives about $2 million a year. 
but I think it's really important to to keep a lookout for that one because it's it's one that is supported supporting collaborative multi benefit projects on the ground and you know to Garrett's point, these are the types of projects that will have the lasting impact on the ground. So I think it's a it's a good tool to be aware of. And then the um, the Great Amer American Outdoors Act, as Garrett mentioned in the beginning, it's pretty incredible that we're about to witness the passage of a, this huge conservation bill. It is, um, again, something that's supported by your Senator, Senator Gardner, and it will provide $900 million a year in mandatory funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. For those that are not familiar with the LWCF, LWCF it's an important tool for protecting uh, federal lands for access for hunting, fishing, recreating, so having that $900 million a year will help ensure the federal government can acquire really valuable pieces of land. In addition to that, it, it provides up to $9.5 billion in funding for deferred maintenance at our national parks, which is a huge, huge amount of money for a really huge problem that needs to be tackled. So it's a, quite a, a, a feat to see that that is even being considered given, um, given where we are with our uh, with our spending levels, but we'll, we'll take it as a win. And it's already passed the Senate on a vote of 73 to 25. And the leadership in the House is already committed to bringing up this bill in late July. So we expect it to pass and we expect the president will sign it at some point later in July. So that will be uh, an exciting day for conservation. So on the, the word of front, um, you know, again, this is this is the bill that uh, Congress typically passes every two years. It authorizes Army Corps of Engineers, flood control projects, ecosystem restoration projects, navigation projects, um, can make modifications to those projects. And additionally, oftentimes it also has changes in policy for the Corps of Engineers. So the Senate ha has moved first on this piece of legislation and has passed S3591 out of the en uh, Environment and Public Works Committee. Uh, this is a bipartisan bill that received full support from all Republicans and Democrats on the committee. That bill awaits floor action in the Senate. Um, the House is on a little bit slower timeline. We were expecting to see the House bill released uh, earlier in June, but that timeline got pushed back, I think, partially because of infrastructure. Um, so we're expecting to see a bill sometime in July. Uh, we've been told to expect a resiliency title in the bill. Uh, unlike infrastructure, um, this, this should be a bipartisan effort and it's gonna be pretty narrowly focused on the Army Corps of Engineers. And, and the reason for doing that is that in, in, in previous years, um, sometimes these, these word of bills, you get to the end of a Congress and it looks like it's the only bill that's got legs. And so it turns into a Christmas tree where everyone tries to throw their, their uh, pet, pet project or pet issue on there. And oftentimes that can drag these bills down. Uh, so they're, they're gonna try to keep it pretty narrowly focused on the core um, and, and keep it separate from infrastructure. So this is gonna move on a path of its own, again, because it's bipartisan and because it's one of those bills that, that uh, Congress likes to pass every two years. So in the appropriations, we're, we're a little bit behind schedule here. Um, the House is, is set to start marking up its appropriations bills uh, in the subcommittees next week. Those will then move to full committee the week of uh, July 12th and off the House floor uh, by the end of July, likely in the form of two minibuses, meaning that they'll package uh, the 12 appropriations bills together in, in a package, each of which contains, you know, somewhere around five or six bills, um, just, just, just purely for the, the sake of, of saving floor time. Uh, the Senate timing is a little bit less clear. They were supposed to be moving on their bills as we speak. Uh, I think obviously COVID, like with everything else, has had a little bit of an impact. Um, but we are expecting the Senate to also try to pass their 12 appropriations bills before Congress goes into its August recess. Given the fact that it's an election year and that we're a little bit behind schedule, uh, we're probably looking at a continuing resolution that'll take us from the end of the fiscal year, which is September 30th, uh, past the election. Uh, so a continuing resolution simply means that, uh, you know, w Congress will fund the agencies at whatever levels they're currently funded at for a given period of time before passing new spending bills. 
one last general comment on the spending bills is, is they're going to look a lot like what Congress passed last year, simply because there was a two year budget agreement that was reached last year and that budget agreement set the overall uh, budgetary numbers for Congress for the last fiscal year and this fiscal year. So, you know, at a top line, we were, we're not talking about significant amounts of new money, a little bit here and there, but uh, we're, we're looking very similar to what we, what we saw in FY20. Great. Um, thank you both very much for that, that excellent overview. An another um, <laughs> good job done com compressing a ton of information into an understandable uh, format and a small amount of time. So thank you both. Um, I've got a handful of questions here. Uh, and if, if it's okay with you, we'll just dive into a brief Q&A before we wrap up for the day. Um, I've got two questions here, one related to WERDA and one related to earmarks. And I think I'm going to tie them together because based on what we heard from Garrett, it doesn't sound like we're going to see a reclamation title, which is important for a lot of the big projects here on the West Slope um, within the WERDA, uh, WERDA bill. So I think the more important question is, in an era without earmarks, how can water users best advocate for funding specific water projects within a potential infrastructure package? Do you guys have any insight or advice for our water users and associations here? Yeah, I, I think um, one, of, one of the really big changes that occurred when Congress essentially banned earmarks was, was um, it, it really empowered federal agencies, right? It gave federal agencies a lot more discretion in determining how they use the dollars that Congress gives them. So before the earmark ban was in place, you know, Congress could appropriate dollars specifically for project A. They can no longer do that, right? So they can only appropriate dollars to a certain program of which, you know, project A may be eligible for those funds. So when it comes to advocating for those dollars and making sure that those dollars are going to places that you want, the earmark ban has really shifted that focus to 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 a place where you need to be spending more time working with with the administration, working with the relevant agencies, whether it's the Department of Interior or USDA, to make sure that they understand your priorities and and are asking Congress because again it, it all comes back to what the administration asks of Congress in terms of funding. So you want to make sure that these agencies are asking Congress for funding in the right programs that you know match up with whatever your specific needs may be. So for example, if you've got a water recycling project, you're going you're to want to make sure that the Title 16 account for Bureau of Reclamation is well funded. It's, it's a competitive program. You still have to go out and compete for those dollars. Um, that's, that's just kind of the, the way it works now because of the ban. But again, it's, it's kind of that rising tides lift all ships mentality where if we create a bigger pie in terms of funding, there's more people that can take a buy out of it, right? Sarah, anything to add on that? I just add that I think at some point we'll see earmarks again. So yeah. we may okay. come back. Crystal ball, all right. Um, this is something I know Sarah has worked on in the past, but uh, question is, Good Samaritan legislation has been a longstanding priority on the West Slope. Uh, do you see any chance of passing a Good Sam bill at the federal level in the coming years? And this goes all the way back to, I mean, uh, more than a decade, I remember former Senator Salazar brought this forward in Colorado um, and attempted to get legislation passed. What do you think the chances of getting anything on Good Samaritan done in the future is? That's a great question. And I can say that we've been working with Senator Gardner on getting a bill introduced. And I think there's this, the high likelihood that there will be a bill introduced before the end of this Congress. I don't foresee that bill passing this Congress, but I think having a bill from the Senate will be a huge um, step forward. And, and Senator Gardner has been a champion on this. And, you know, I think he's, he's committed to, to figuring out a way forward. Uh, Trout Unlimited is leading the way on the conservation side, and they're working with other conservation groups, as well as the National Mining Association, to come up with a, you know, a, a, a compromise bill that allows for a pilot project to go forward in a way that makes all sides comfortable with what it looks like. So, you know, we've gotten, we're really close to getting to a place where um, that bill will get introduced. So I feel good about that. 
um, like all bills in in Congress right now, it's trying to figure out a path forward and what what it, you know what package or what um, vehicle it would go on. But having it out there will be really important to build support for it. So I think we're closer than we we have been in a long time. So I'm feeling optimistic. Great, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate your insight. I just got a question via text, um, so it's good to know people, I guess. Um, <laughs> although that may be more relevant to the state stuff. Um, I'll jump uh, into one other question I've got here on my desktop, um, and it's related to the recovery programs for the Colorado River and the San Juan, which of course are incredibly successful and incredibly important for West Slope water users and water users throughout the state. Um, the question is, hydropower generation revenues have historically paid for a significant chunk of the upper Colorado and San Juan recovery programs but it appears we cannot count on those revenues after 2023 when those programs are set to expire. Are you aware of any funding sources being discussed or considered that could cover the cost of those important but expensive programs? I can start and say that I can tell you all that it is certainly a topic that's under uh, discussion back in DC and you know, it's it's one that we, I think, all need to think about long term, what are some other viable alternative solutions to fund that program, given that, yes, the 2023 deadline is looming, but also the fact that with lower flows, we have lower revenue sources, streams coming in from hydropower. So in general, I think that there's um, there's some some folks that are looking at ways to come up with some creative solutions. Um, you know, the lower basin has the multi-species, I'm going to not get the whole name right, but their endangered species program, which is a 50-50 match, something like that, you know, could be considered as a model. There are other things out there, but I do think that having all the groups that care about that, um, that program need to come together and, and work collaboratively to come up with a solution that's going to work. Okay. Garrett, anything to add? Nailed it. I mean, I, 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 the only thing I would add there is collaboration being really important for longevity, right? Because, you know, what we often see is with, with water policy in Congress is these massive swings um, from, from left to right when you have changes in the political winds, right? And so if you're looking for something that's really going to last uh, and stand the test of time and provide the, the reliability that you need, um, that collaboration and that that whole you know idea of bringing people to the table is is extremely important in that those situations. Okay, thank you. Um, we're right at the top of the hour, so I'll uh, I'm not seeing a lot more questions come in, but I've got one that I think I'll pick on Garrett as a product of the lower basin, um, and it the question's pretty simple. I'm happy to chime in here as well, um, but it's uh, what is meant by lower basin overuse. You know, I candidly, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> um, so this is, is something we talk a lot about in the upper basin and, and one of the problems that's driving the, the, the uh, reduction of storage levels in Lake Powell and Lake Mead um, is just the, the overuse of lower basin states uh, beyond what they were originally entitled to under the Colorado River Compact. Um, one thing Sarah may know a little bit about just from DCP is that the lower basin states are for the first time working to address some of that overuse. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and I think we should give them credit, um, especially California for, for actually taking reductions. One thing as a representative of a water management agency in the upper basin, I will say is that um, we here feel as though that may not be enough. And, and the triggers for those reductions in use come only when Lake Mead is at its absolute lowest levels. So um, for us, we, we need to be able to give credit where credit is due, but also understand that um, in the upper basin, we, we want to encourage the lower basin states to try and do more. <laughs> so. Well, Garrett has a lot of friends in California, so he can, he can call them up and tell them to stop using their water. That will yeah, help. if you could send some texts, that'd be great. So. <laughs> Consider it done. <laughs> so. Um, I do have one other question. Um, it's not something I know much about um, related to Salton Sea and Delta issues. I'll, I'll read it. Um, if we don't have a good answer here, I'll come up with some information with my team and, and send it out, but I'll read it for the good of the order. How do we foresee the Delta and Salton Sea affecting federal 2026 policy? 
Anybody? I'm not a lawyer well, based expert by any means. I, as, as a Californian, when you say Delta, I think of the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, and that's probably not what we're referring to here. I think we're probably uh, talking about the Colorado River Delta, but. Um, well, um, the, the Salton Sea is a big component of, of, of understanding California's complex water system. So we got to figure that part out. And I know that there's a, a, lot, a lot of folks that are working on that, both from the state and federal and the local levels. Um, I, I'm not an expert on it, but I, and I know it's complicated, but I don't know what the reference to 2026 is. Um, I just know that there is, um, there, there is some, you know, there's definitely um, some pressure on those folks to try and figure out a sustainable path forward for the Salton Sea. Right. I think, you know, we, we started off hearing about some of the budgetary challenges in Colorado. I mean, the same is true for, for California, right? Um, prior to COVID, there was a lot of talk about the state of California stepping up with some pretty significant amounts of money for the Salton Sea. And, you know, given the, the hit that their budget has taken as a result of COVID, it's, it's probably something that, that gets pushed further out into the future. Um, and, and not knowing fully what that 2026 deadline is is referencing I, you know anything any delay on a salt and sea issue um if there is some looming deadline is is probably going to create some challenges right um that's a good point and and i guess i would note um not being a salt and sea expert but but looking back at the dcp negotiations and the heavy acts that that um salt and sea folks uh wielded over those negotiations it's always something to keep an eye on so um with that, I, I think I'll wrap up and just thank you both so much for being here with us today. Um, thanks to all the attendees. We're still holding strong at nearly 80 attendees. Um, I, I hope that folks found it interesting. And I wanna just, uh, again, thank Sarah and Garrett for being here and carving time out of their busy schedules to give us a good overview, so. Happy to be here. Appreciate thank the you. opportunity. Thanks guys, really appreciate it. And to everyone else, we, um, those questions on the state affairs issues that we didn't get to, uh, we at the River District will work with others to try and provide some written responses to you as soon as possible. Thank you again for being here. Keep an eye out for our upcoming Water With Your Lunch uh, webinars. The next one will be uh, related to big river issues and hydrology in the upper basin, uh, specifically on Colorado's Western Slope. And so we hope to see you there. Uh, thank you again. Be safe, stay well, have a great day. Bye-bye.